I'm here to witness the uncovering of one of London's better kept secrets. For years, a truly great collection of art has languished, neglected in the dingier rooms of the V&A. But not anymore. As the art installers get to work, I've been invited behind the scenes at the new galleries. Now it all begins here with the medieval collections. Well, I have to say it's the most inventively elastic use of the word medieval that I think I've ever come across here. We've got a wonderful 6th century mosaic head of Christ made in Ravenna, but it's very much still Christ as the Roman god Apollo, fresh-faced without a beard. But here we've got one of the real curiosities of the display, a reminder that the V&A isn't just a museum of fine art. These are an ancient Egyptian's bright red pair of socks, circa 300 AD. I love the fact they've got cloven feet, perfect for wearing with sandals. Now, call me old-fashioned, but I think of those things as Byzantium, ancient Egypt, ancient Rome, not really medieval. Here, I am in the Middle Ages, most definitely, looking up at that amazing stone gargoyle made in southwestern England, pulling a face like some ancient English version of Homer Simpson. Here is one of the great objects in all of the V&A's collections. It's the so-called Gloucester candlestick. It's created in about 1104, and it's a real masterpiece of English medieval metalwork. It's more than just a candlestick. It's actually a kind of tabletop allegory of heaven and hell, a snakes and ladders vision of people tumbling down into darkness and rising up into the light towards where the flame of the candle would once have flickered. What strikes me about the display is the powerful connections made between different cultures in different parts of the world. And thanks to the breadth of the V&A's collections, you get a tremendously strong sense of Christendom as a single realm stretching from Dunfermline to Beirut, from England to France to Italy and beyond. Behind me, we've got these exceptionally rare, beautiful stained glass windows from La Sainte Chapelle in Paris itself. And down here is the tomb effigy of a knight of the De Lucy line who was buried in Kent in the 1340s. What's really rare about this sculpture is the traces of polychrome painting that are still left on it. And if you look closely, you can see that he's wearing these rather, rather precious yellow cross garters, a bit of a Malvolio. And here's, for me, definitely the rarest and most moving object in this room. It was made in Italy in 1300 by probably Giovanni Pisano. Henry Moore once said that the Pisano family, father and son, were for him the greatest sculptors ever to have lived. And I think if you look at a figurine like this, you can see what he was driving at, because what the Pisano gave to Italian sculpture was this sense above all, of a living, suffering body. Look at the cut in Christ's side. Look at his emaciated body. Look at the way the skin is stretched over the ribs. It's a compelling image of the suffering Christ. The quality and range of objects on display are exceptional. But for me, the real reason to celebrate these new galleries is still to come. Now, remarkably few people are aware of the fact that the V&A just happens to contain one of the world's very greatest collections of Renaissance sculpture, every bit as important as the National Gallery's much more famous collection of Renaissance paintings. Now, the reason why it's remained rather a well-kept secret is that for generations it's been tucked away on the ground floor of the museum. Now, the new display is going to put it centre stage and really show people what a treasure trove stuffed full of masterpieces it actually is. <laughs> It was at the V&A that I first fell in love with Renaissance sculpture, as did my good friend Danny Katz on a schoolboy visit. Now he's one of the world's leading dealers in this field. This is our idea of a dream date. Danny. Ah, oh, this is amazing, this thing. I know, just, it's amazing. Every time I see it, it just <laughs> does something to me, that sculpture. How are you? I'm very well. These, are, these rooms are so amazing. Isn't it great to, to see, see that... it like this? It's extraordinary. <laughs> but it's, it was... it's been so long that these things have been in the dark. Well, Over here, we've got probably the best Donatello. Well, I would certainly and... see the best one in England. Although you uh... can't quite see because I haven't done the lighting. I don't know if one of our guys could bring a light. Could you bring a light? You're supposed to light these things from the side. 
Well, this is always a problem. There was a... Um, oh, look at that, though. Oh, God, look at that. It's incredible because right from the foreground to the back, there's incredible perspective from trees, from figures going all the way back into the landscape. In the catalogue entry, it says, in the distance of this landscape, you can see the towers of Jerusalem. That's the heavenly city, Jerusalem. Yeah, yes. Now, in normal light, you cannot see that. Yeah, yeah. Put this in context, Danny, for... As, as a European sculpture man, um, you know, where is this in the This canon? is a masterpiece. You don't get better than this. What it's else should we look at? The Donatello Roundel here. This is incredible sculptures. I remember when the Victoria and Albert Museum acquired this about 30 years ago. It belonged to a lady in London who used it as an ashtray. <laughs> and they were stubbing their cigarettes out in, on it. And then it, was, it came to the attention of the director at the time, Sir John Pope Benesey, who immediately recognized it was the lost Donatello uh, made for Dr. Cellini, his physician. It's also interesting that Donatello, when he cast it, he made it like an intaglio reverse at the back, so you could pour molten glass into the back of it and take a casting glass out. So it's, well, it's actually got its own mechanism for self-reproduction. So, yeah, well, oh, exactly. That's fantastic. Self -reproduction. Maybe if we asked them really nicely, they'd let us pour some um, wax in and make our own. Well, or maybe not. I yeah. think I'm getting no, I'm getting nose. Getting nose on that one. But now that you told me all that, I didn't know any of that. Yeah. But, but the fact that it belonged to him, I sort of feel I want to angle this plinth. Look at it. I want to let him look at it again. Yeah. Or take that and put it right in front of him. That yeah, would be rather yeah, fun. Yeah. I wonder if they could have a conversation, the sculptor and the posi well, position. They haven't they? even finished the display and we're already trying to know, rearrange I it. Yeah, I know. <laughs> let's come it's this way. Let's, yeah, let, actually, let's yes. carry on. Because we could talk for all bloody year. I know, it's extraordinary. We've left the early Renaissance behind, we left Donatello behind. And we're heading towards this rather mysterious little dark twist of wax. I know, Nothing much, amazing. is it? Nothing much. This is a work by Michelangelo. What's amazing about these, I think, as well, is, is just how unusual it is for something like this to have survived. Well, it's just extraordinary. I mean, if it, it, it does, I mean, put heat next to it, it'll melt. I mean, there are a few of these that exist, these in the Academia in Florence, there's some, but to have one here in London in the V&A is extraordinary. Should we go and have a look over here? There's another wonderful, small uh, object. But we're in the other side of Europe now. We're, well, we're, we're in the we're north. We're, in, we're north of the Alps. We're in northern Germany. Actually, this might have been done in Poland, in Krakow. The artist is called Weitstoss or Wittstoss. But this, I think, is probably the most perfect, most beautiful small carving since antiquity. It is heavenly. It is actually it's heavenly not. beautiful. You, you look at something like this and you wonder how long did that take? I mean, how... Oh, I should think that took a year to carve that. You've got in that object condensed a year of that person's time, that person's thought, that person's sensitivity, that person's skill, that person's training. I know, I know. It's just, it's, it's just, it, it's wonderful. It's mind-boggling. I mean, that's a museum in itself. Yes. With over 1,800 exhibits, Danny and I could spend a lifetime studying this collection. But with the installers still hard at work, we don't want to outstay our welcome. When you assess what they've done here over the last eight years, ten years, you know, now here it is. This is what they've decided to do with this great collection of Renaissance sculpture. Thumbs up, thumbs down. Thumbs up and ask me in a hundred years time and I'll tell you what I think then. I think this is going to last a long, long time. I mean, I feel sorry for uh, the Italian tourist office that uh, you don't have to go to Florence. But can they do a good cappuccino in can, the, in the well, coffee shop they, just to get the real well, flavour of Italy? No, you can't get a good cappuccino anywhere no, outside. I, well, I don't think you can even get it outside Naples, personally. Oh, Naples. Florence does some good.